Mm -hmm. uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, super excited to have you today um, in our partnership with MC Saatchi uh, on our webinar on the post-IDFA era and what it means for mobile advertising. So just a few notes. The audience during this is muted. If you have any questions, we had a lot of registrations, so we turn up the Q&A questions to minimize the noise. But if you have any questions, please email them to angelyatbranch.io. She will be looking through all the questions and let us know what we can do. The webinar is being recorded. And, um, uh, and let me tell you a few, a few things about Branch. So Branch is a mobile growth platform. We work with over 50,000 of the world's top apps that run on Branch. And we help with both growth, which comes with deep linking, but also attributions. Uh, we have 12 offices, but now everyone's working from home and we have about 350 employees and raised a ton of money in funding. And these are some of the great brands that we work with. So this is, I'm Mada, I'm one of the founders and head of marketing. I'm located in the Bay Area and you'll hear my dog in the background. I apologize for that. And um, I'll let Kabir introduce himself. And you need to unmute him because uh, he can't unmute himself. Hey, hi. Uh, hey guys, I am a managing partner for uh, MNC Saji Performance for APAC. We, uh, we work with a number of digital native companies uh, across Southeast Asia, India, and Australia. And yeah, uh, look forward to this uh, webinar. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us, Kabir. And Alex? Yeah, thanks, thanks Kabir. Uh, I'm Alex, CEO and co-founder of Branch. Um, uh, like one sentence statement about me, uh, more educated as a physicist, but fell in love with mobile as a platform. And uh, actually for a lot of the reasons that we're on this webinar today, because things change so fast and it's so fun to be a part of, so. Super, super excited to have you both. So I'm gonna stop sharing and we can just uh, have this as a discussion. So. <clears throat> You know, let's start with what actually happened. Uh, and maybe, maybe we'll start with you, Alex. Yeah, so I think everybody probably knows at this point, because you, you, know, you were interested in listening into us talk on the subject, but Apple finally did it after years of discussions and you know, many conspiracy theories and actual questions on whether they would do it or not they've finally made a move to crack down on the usage of the IDFA. Uh, the IDFA really quickly, uh, as like a, a bit of an intro, is the ID for advertising. Um, it's been in use for like very, very long. I think Kabir, when we were talking, it was like eight years basically when it was introduced. And um, the change that was made is now Whereas before, uh, any iPhone user that downloaded an app, that app could read this ID directly unless they had proactively gone and limited ad tracking and set limited ad tracking to true. In this new change, that flag, limit ad tracking, will be set to true by default globally for every device. And now, the app must prompt the user for their permission. And we can talk a little bit more about the specifics of that. Uh, and the user must accept before that app can read the IDFA. And so effectively, the usage of that will largely depend on a couple things, like whether companies choose to um, actually prompt users, which I think is an open question. And then should they choose to prompt users, there's the question of, will users actually opt in? And we'll talk, I know we'll have a bunch of discussion about, about that, but the main change, you know, now that I think we're, we're gonna discuss on this, on this call is, is really the, uh, the fact that IDFA will be much more difficult to access than it was previously. Why do you think this is like gonna impact the ecosystem so, so much? Why is this important? Why is everyone talking about this? Yeah, so the, you know, the IDFA, just to give a little explanation of how it's used. So, you know, on, I'll try to go as technical and then I'm sure we'll, you know, talk more about this as we go. Um, has an, a bunch of different use cases. 
specifically from the measurement side, which is I think more of the angle that we'll talk about, we'll also mention other aspects. Um, the way that like an act tracking or measuring the performance of app focused campaigns happens in the majority of cases, there's sort of the source publisher app that reads the IDFA. And then there's the advertiser sort of destination app that reads the IDFA. And if a user tapped on the ad or clicked on the ad in the source app, then goes and downloads that app, you can use the IDFA to compare across the source app and the advertiser app and check, did this user, is there, are they the same people? Did they click on that ad? And so if this were no longer accessible, we will lose sort of that constant sort of universal key that all advertisers and publishers and people use to communicate with one another to determine origin and, you know, a bunch of other things around attribution. There's also a lot of other use cases of this device ID around audience targeting and, you know, a whole host of other sort of like uh, ad tech products that depend on it because it is sort of a universal identifier for a user in the device. Um, so all of those things now will fundamentally have to change if the IDFA is no longer accessible. And, and Kabir, you know, we were chatting in our precinct about how this will affect the everyday iOS user. Uh, can you kind yeah. of give an explanation around that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, just, just, just before I go into that, I'll, I'd like to like kind of give a little more context on the IDFA uh, to, to the audience here. Um, yeah. And uh, in general, uh, if you, and for a day-to-day -day iOS user, right? So for example, if you are on a fashion e-commerce app and you're checking out, say for example, a trouser and you, you see a few trousers, perhaps add something to the cart and then you don't do anything. And then you actually go to, say, for example, Facebook or a news app or something like that. And a few moments later, you see that trouser appearing again on that uh, on that uh, on that web uh, website or app uh, as uh, retargeted to you as an ad. That basically the entire the entire flow of that actually happens through the IDFA. So as as uh, Alex mentioned, I IDFA is. Uh, extremely important to the ad tech ecosystem, especially like mainly on Apple because it's the identifier for iOS devices. But it's um, uh, the use of IDFA is uh, obviously on measurement, but also uh, highly on like target uh, behavioral targeting or retargeting. Or there are a lot of things that we're going to explore in this. <clears throat> Coming back to the question uh, that Mada raised, right? I think we need to understand what this announcement is. And what exactly is going to happen in the next few uh, next few months? So, uh, so uh, Apple has actually made a few announcements here, and they're all related to privacy. So it's not just on the IDFA. We will obviously be talking more on the IDFA, but there are a number of like privacy-related uh, announcements that uh, Apple has made. Uh, the, there are a few few ones which are like on your camera. So, for example. If an app is using your camera at any time, the green light will uh, switch on. If an app is, if another app is using your uh, microphone, uh, an orange light will switch on. Uh, uh, even even stuff like on your, uh, if an app is asking you for permission to use their photo gallery, uh, you don't need to actually give permission for the entire gallery. You could just select certain photographs, and same with contact list as well. So there are a bunch of like privacy announcements and this was one of them. <clears throat> the one that we are talking about is on the IDFA. So how it's going to be changing for the user is that uh, iOS 14 is I think going to come out in September. And if a person, uh, uh, if a person has uh, transitioned to iOS 14 uh, they, and they download an app, the, they would basically get a system prompt message, which will say that this app is uh, wants your permission to track you across other apps. And it could also say something like they need to actually track you to be able to show personalized ads, right? Now, based on what the person does that time, if he says, okay, I opt in, I'm happy to see personalized ads, or I say opt out, uh, everything will change. So <clears throat> if a person opts in, everything is perfect because we, we go as, as it is, yeah. but 
it's very likely that a lot of people will opt out because in general there has been a lot of like uh, uh, like flack against uh, personalized advertising. Uh, so uh, but the wording so also. If Sorry? you read the wording, the wording is incredibly aggressive. So it's not aggressive. just the, the slag, but I think if you read the wording, I think Apple really took this to the next level. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, uh, so uh, and if a person opts out, then it is, we will also discuss this in detail, but it is most likely that they would not see a targeted ad. We will tell you how this might still be possible later, but uh, most likely in, in a, in, in, in most cases, they will not see a targeted ad. So, you are a uh, you are a 25 year old guy, and uh, you are on uh, on say for example uh, on on any app. You might you you in the past you might be seeing like ads for shirts and trousers and belts, and you might now you might end up seeing uh, pregnancy test ads or uh, or for example uh, an ad for a skirt. So, uh, so it, it ads will get less relevant, and that is actually going to be a big impact on uh, on on advertising, right? Especially app advertising, and it also affects measurement, which we will be discussing in the in the in the in the, in the webinar later. Yeah, it's a very interesting. I mean, the idea of Faye was people could actually um, disable it and they could reset it. So it's. Um, you know, to some extent, it was already in the hands of the user, but it wasn't, they weren't telling the user that it's bad and now they're going in that Yeah, direction. I think, uh, I think just to add, right, I think, uh, again, going back on the conspiracy theory, uh, Alex, I just read about it. I don't agree to it at all. I completely, <laughs> uh, I completely believe that Apple has the right intentions. And I think yeah. uh, in general, Apple has been a flag bearer for privacy for years, right? And even if you hear... Uh, interviews of Steve, Steve Jobs, he's clearly said that we need to ask our users every time if they like to be tracked, right? So I think um, uh, overall, I, I would say it's a welcome move by Apple. And, uh, uh, and e even if you see the history, right? Like for the last eight years, uh, Apple has been trying to kind of uh, diminish or inhibit the use of the IDFA. Um, uh, actually, like just to give context to the audience as well, for the last eight years, so when when I started in, in in mobile marketing, there used to be there used to be no IDFA. There used to be a another uh, ID called the UDID, which used to be uh, which used used which which was used for advertising or even for measurement, and yeah. that actually it wasn't resettable. Uh, sorry, it wasn't resettable, right? Yeah, exactly. And then uh, Apple start uh, Apple completely took UDID off and then they uh, then they introduced IDFA I think in 2012 and what IDFA how IDFA was different to UDID was that it was resettable by the user what that means is an iOS user could go into their settings and reset their uh, their IDFA what that means is if your IDFA is different your uh, you will not be recognized uh, buy other apps anymore. So you will be a new device. So it's like almost changing your name, right? So your name is mother and suddenly you say, okay, my, my name is something else, right? So you're not, uh, you, you might have the same face, but you might not be actually recognized by a lot of people because your name is completely yeah. changed. And um, so that was something introduced by uh, Apple in 2012. So a lot of people used to use that because if someone was, a kind of tired of their uh, ads that they were being retargeted with or being shown very personalized ads, they would just reset their ID once in a while. In 2016, <clears throat> Apple went one step ahead and then they, they announced the limit ad tracking capability. That was again another setting on their uh, on, on the Apple device that you could go and enable limit ad tracking. That essentially means that you will not be able to be tracked. and. Uh, historic data, I think in the last three, four years, historic uh, data suggests that I think are around 30% of, between 20 to 30% of all Apple users have enabled that. <clears throat> so 20 to 30% of Apple users currently do not have an IDFA anyway. They haven't been being, being tracked because they, uh, people have enabled a limited ad tracking. Another interesting, actually very interesting thing that Apple has also released this time is that on your setting, you can actually, this time, you can actually go and change 
uh, this setting that uh, that enables you to disallow apps to even ask you to track them. So you can actually go on your on your on your phone and say disallow apps to ask me to track me. Yeah. That means they can't even ask you if they want to track you. It's just a big no, right? It's, it's, so I think, yeah, it's been, it's been uh, like if a lot of people actually, when I read some articles, a lot of people are very surprised by what this, ha- this happened, but it was coming, right? And I think it, it is, it was, it was uh, with the way Apple has been behaving. Uh, I think the industry was expecting it. And a lot of ad tech companies have had started building products around them outside of the idfa to be ready for the for the next phase right yeah yeah and i mean i I think it's important to recognize you know that this is done for the sake of privacy and this is a really big win for privacy because ultimately if there is something like a device id there are you know there are going to be companies that will use that for evil purposes in a way that will you know make users uncomfortable and there, it's just impossible to create an ecosystem when that thing exists that you know can actually protect users' privacy. I mean, you look at like even credit cards, which is a very very sensitive identifier, like bought and sold on the internet like crazy, in, in for illegal purposes. And so ultimately, I think this is a really big win for users. But we as a industry need to figure out you know, how do we, how do we develop around it? How do we work in an environment where it doesn't exist? So we can probably assume that uh, opt-in rates will be low. Uh, I've, I've seen some studies saying that, you know, maybe they've asked users and 30% of the users are going to opt in. I don't think that that's probably going to be true based on everything you guys just talked about. So if we assume that the opt-in rates are low, how is this going to actually affect the ecosystem? So let's yeah, talk actually, about the uh, uh, Yeah, uh, Madha, actually, just to like kind of uh, uh, stop you there, on the opt-in rates, I think we still do not know, right? And we can only guess. So I think uh, what I say is that we should, uh, uh, we should plan for the worst and hope for the best, right? That means uh, uh, we, can, we can hope that a lot of people might opt in, and uh, but we should plan that say for example no one opts in and then what does the industry look like but uh, if you see a lot of people have been looking at say for example the gdpr uh, consent cookie uh, approval rate and that for good publishers for some good publishers who customize their messaging quite well it's been up to like 30 40 percent uh, which is which which is something a lot of uh, uh, advertisers now or ad tech companies are taking as uh, and uh, advocacy for uh, IDFA as well, and they are uh, they are assuming that it might be 30, 40 percent. The other th- thing we need to note is there is some kind of customizability on the system prompt message that comes on your app, right? So that customization might uh, how well the uh, app developer or publisher uh, positions that customization, it might actually. Uh, be good or uh, bad for the publisher, right? They might have higher opt-ins if they have customized it well. And I think over the next few years, there might be best practices that might be put into place, which might increase opt-in percentages as well. Uh, So clearly, I think it will be low, but we can't actually go out and say, hey, it's going to be 0% or it's going to be 5. We will know when it comes, right? Perhaps by Q1 2021, we should have a much clearer idea. Yeah. And I, I think mm-hmm. extending on it too, um, you know, we've been talking with um, Facebook and Google and others about it. Uh, the first thing to, you know, highlight about these opt-in rates. Um, so I think it's, you know, maybe we do see a GDPR like, you know, Kabir mentioned, but it has to happen on both the publisher and the advertiser side to actually make the match and, you know, make it somewhat useful. And so can both, you know, maybe Facebook might be able to get that, but some, you know, a smaller gaming app or something like that might not be able to get this carry the same weight. The other, the other uh, area that people are exploring to potentially try to improve opt-in rates is blocking functionality based off of opting in. And I've heard internally that Apple is still reviewing whether they're going to 
um, actually allow that via the policy or not. Um, yeah. they, haven't, they haven't made up their mind. But even so, you know, um, this might be something that like a Facebook or, uh, you know, Snap or somebody might try to block their functionality pending user mm -hmm. uh, opt-in. But like that would hit one of their top line public company metrics, which is daily active users. And yeah. so if they at all affect that metric, it can dramatically impact their business. And I think, you know, they would definitely not do that without testing it very, very carefully. Um, but, you know, just the fact that it's got to be sort of bimodal and, you know, but both sides need to get opt in and um, there's so much uncertainty. I think what you said, Kabir, is exactly right. Let, let's plan for the worst and, you know, be delighted by, <laughs> by the upside. Yeah. So a, a very a small follow up question that I th I'm sure others are thinking and I've heard this before is when do people have to make that ask? Is it as soon as uh, the launch happens? Is it when they access that? Like when, when is that, what is that? When do they have to make that? When do they have to make the prompt? When do they have to show the prompt? Is it when someone yeah. opens the app? Do they have a choice in that? Yeah, I think uh, the documentation is out there uh, on, on the Apple website. And I think uh, uh, they would they can start making it right now. Uh, but I, I, it's basically going to be released with the iOS 14 release. So they can start working with their product team to uh, to make sure that it's customized. I think there's another thing that they'll have to add is uh, on the App Store page of the app, they will also have to list down what are, what are the types of data you collect and uh, and how it might get used. So even before a person installs an app on your App Store page, they might be able to read uh, what the different components of, uh, of tracking they might be using. Um, and I think, yeah, so just to answer your question, I think, uh, the the documentation is out there, so I would rec recommend app publishers out there to start going and reading more about it, and perhaps working with your marketing team to make sure that the messaging is is correct and it's uh, to optimize towards higher opt-in rates. Yeah. Cool. Okay, so uh, let's move on. While we think the um, how this is how you guys think this is going to affect. Uh, uh, the ecosystem. I think we have everything from self-attributing networks to the publisher to the ad networks. Um, <clears throat> maybe you can each take pieces of the ecosystem and talk a little bit about how you think this will affect them. I, I think just to make sure it's clear, you know, we talked a lot about, about opt-in strategies and they're, they're sort of a bright hope, but probably for the rest of the conversation, we're going to make the assumption that opt-in rates are very low yeah. and the opt-in rate would not be accessible, just to make sure that's that's clear, everybody. Um, I don't know. Uh, we've definitely got a lot to peel back on this onion on what could be affected. You want to you want to start start us sure, off? Sure, sure, yeah. I think uh, there are uh, a number of stakeholders that might get affected with this and would get affected for sure. I think one are uh, retargeting networks, uh, definitely because their entire ad tech is based on IDFA or similar identifiers on Android as well. Uh, so retargeting networks, I'm actually the most pessimistic about on what they will be able to do in the future. Uh, because without an IDFA, it is impossible to uh, retarget you unless you have some other level of data, which we'll come back to uh, uh, in, 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 in other, when I, when I explain some other point. Uh, the other one is actually the publisher, right? So for example, a publisher who actually monetizes their inventory through advertising, uh, now, when an ad is actually shown to a user which is relevant or targeted or personalized, uh, the CPM for that ad is usually higher. So say, for example, if you're getting a $1 CPM for targeted personalized advertising, you might actually get much lesser, uh, much lesser for a much, le much lower CPM for a non-targeted irrelevant ad. Uh, so it might be say 50 cents. And I think there, there are, I think Alex had some stats on that as well. Uh, that uh, I think it was 50%, right, Alex? Yeah, Facebook actually published a post strangely about three days before WWDC that did a study comparing publisher revenue of personalized ads where you can do personalization and uh, ads where you can't. Mm -hmm. And they saw a 50% drop in publisher revenue for yeah. unpersonalized ads. So a lot of those business models that you described just become like unsustainable. 
Exactly. And I think, so uh, that actually changes as well. Uh, the next is actually the most interesting one uh, where I think uh, a lot of people are on the fence is with Facebook and Google. Uh, a lot of people feel that Facebook and Google would also be affected. I personally feel Facebook and Google would be affected, but would be the least affected. And that, that means that uh, marketing budgets might get skewed more towards them uh, than against them. Uh, there are a few reasons for that. <clears throat> Facebook and Google are also, uh, one is Facebook and Google are supposed to be the safe havens of digital marketing. So it's said that if a digital marketer doesn't know where to spend their money, they spend it on Facebook and Google. And with especially this uh, part where measurement might get less, less efficient or targeting might get less efficient, people might spend more on, on these platforms. The other part about this is, uh, one is uh, while everyone else does IDFA level targeting, a lot of uh, talk, the amount of data that Facebook and Google have on you is much, much, much bigger. And I think, uh, uh, so for example, on Facebook, you can also retarget people or use custom audiences just using phone numbers or email addresses, right? So does that stop? I don't think so because Apple, uh, while it can talk about privacy, but it can't inhibit Facebook using uh, phone numbers or email addresses, right? <coughs> Over a period of time, I, I feel that uh, if this continues and more publishers might go and more app publishers more might go and sign up with Facebook audience network or Google ad mob because they might actually be able to show much more relevant ads if they sign up on that and that increases their CPM as well. Uh, this is actually, this could also be, say, uh, this could also be like Facebook and Google might, uh, might in the future, perhaps uh, uh, when they're actually selling their SDK for advertising, they might actually also ask uh, publishers to use their logins, for example, because uh, Facebook and Google have their logins on multiple websites and the uh, email addresses and phone numbers they collect, <clears throat> then they can match that data back to different devices. So that's something I feel, which is which I prefer, which I feel is not great for, for the industry because then again, what is happening is spends which were already very skewed towards Facebook and Google get more skewed towards them. And then it's not a level playing field for everyone. So, yeah. uh, but we'll have to see actually, like we don't know how strict Apple is going to be about this saying that, oh, now we are banning IDFA in the future. We might be able to ban like use of uh, email addresses and phone numbers as well. Uh, but at this point of time, it seems as if Facebook and Google might get stronger. Yeah. yeah. I think it's, uh, I mean, it's such an important point that I think affects everybody in this ecosystem, you know, no matter if you're an advertiser or a publisher, you know, or network in the stack, it's just, like any time that there's a case where transparency, you know, is reduced, like in this case where there's an ID that every, what sort of makes it e easy for a, a startup to go in and do very user specific targeting. When that disappears, whoever has the most data wins. And so it's this, the walled gardens of Facebook and Google get, you know, the walls of those gardens get a lot thicker and taller and you know the rest of us are all left out in the cold um but the i think the like i think the one specific thing and we'll get a little bit into this about when we talk more about sort of the measurement side um you know the just the you started to touch on this but the like google as an example just has such an unprecedented amount of data both you know tracking everything that you do on your android device through google play services you know, they've made more or less forced every app in the world to integrate Firebase and they're sending all of that data to their, you know, user profiling and ad engine. Um, like there's not a single place you can go on the internet now where Google doesn't observe you to believe that they're not creating profiles through probabilistic IP based or other types of matching, I think would be naive. And so the, just the depth of, <laughs> You know, they, don't, they never needed the IDFA to begin with, most likely. Mm -hmm. And I think their move specifically on the measurement side recently, uh, if, for those of you that were aware, uh, earlier this year, Google made an announcement where they actually said 
they're going to stop confirming device level attributions for search inventory on iOS. So before, if you were spending on iOS search ads with universal app campaigns, Google would actually tell you, oh, this specific user, this IDFA came from this campaign you're running. And they stopped doing that and they moved to a, what they call modeled conversion, which is in effect like a, a model based off of IP address and a whole host of other things um, to determine, you know, an estimate for that campaign. And so they've, they've even started moving to this direction before this announcement happened. And, you, you know, you probably believe that might be sort of the next step now that we're going to lose that device level yeah. identifier. Yeah. So it's, they already have the power to do it and it's going to, you know, hurt us all greatly. Yeah. Also, I so, think just to add, right. Uh, sorry. Uh, I was just actually uh, adding to a few of the other players in the ecosystem, which will get affected. Uh, yeah. And I think uh, even like publishers who monetize their data. So for example, publishers who sell their data to third party uh, data companies will highly get affected because uh, the primary key that is used in these kind of uh, data plugs is your IDFA and everything that's built uh, is uh, is on the IDFA. So that might uh, actually get affected as well. And uh, because of that, third party data companies who obviously uh, collect data and then sell it to advertisers would also get highly affected. Uh, the other one is uh, like user acquisition players, right? Like ad networks or programmatic players who are in the user acquisition space. A lot of them have actually built their device graphs and all of that based on IDFA. Uh, so yeah. that might get highly affected as well. And the other thing is in general, app marketing could become less effective because one, it would be less measurable. And the second is it would be less targeted. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and the third is you can't use exclusion lists anymore. So a lot of times you would, you put a exclusion list inside your DSP and say, okay, do not show ads to these people because they already have my app, but now, uh, without the IDFA, it might not be possible. So that might actually, so these are three factors and this, this is the worrying part, right? Because, uh, if, at least for the near future. Uh, like once iOS 14 is released and until we have like a uh, better things to look into uh, digital marketing, especially for apps might get less effective. Uh, and yeah, that's, that's the big worry, but I think we should like kind of, sorry. Yeah. Oh, no, no. We'll, we'll finish your thought. Yeah, no, I, I think, yeah, I think, and the last one that, uh, that I think we are here to discuss is measurement partners or how does this affect attribution and what is yeah. the future of it? I think uh, like, Perhaps, so uh, Alex, do you want to like start, start that off? Yeah. I mean, I'll, just like what you described already though, even before we get into the measurement side is basically mm -hmm. apocalypse. <laughs> I mean, there's no other way to look at this other than, you know, we're talking about thousands of companies, you know, perhaps if not, th you know, tens of thousands of employees, just everybody's day-to-day -day life will be some way impacted if you're involved in mobile advertising and mobile marketing. Um, it, is, it is just such a dramatic change. And, you know, hopefully a lot of folks have been thinking about this for, you know, some time in advance, but um, it's tough. So, okay, let's talk about the measurement side. Uh, I think the measurement side at this point is currently uh, in an effect, sort of in a state of confusion. And it's in a state of confusion mainly because uh, there's active discussions and collaboration now with some of the top self-attributing networks like Google, Facebook, et cetera, to sort out exactly how they want to do, um, you know, support the measurement programs going forward. So the main options that I think are on the table, there's really two directions and then possible permutations that combine them and all that kind of stuff. But for now, let's just describe two different uh, main directions. The one direction, which is sort of what Apple prefers and uh, what they introduced an alternative that we haven't talked about yet, and we will, um, which is the aggregate data only method. Um, they, Apple built a couple of years back this library called um, the SK Ad Network, 
specifically to support allowing generic and aggregate level conversion data to be sent back to really whoever registered, but the ad network that drove the transaction. There's in this mechanism, you are not able to determine that a specific user originated from a campaign. And so all you can tell is aggregate, like high level statistics, such as, you know, total number of clicks, total number of installs. And uh, there is some limited support for the ability to send a conversion value, I think within like 24 hours of the install, but the conversion value is like a number and it's very, very limited in its capabilities. Um, so just generally you get only aggregate information. IDFA, on the other hand, was the other direction, which is user level optimization, where you actually know that this specific user, you know, came from this campaign and you can build internal models based on users and do user level targeting and do all the stuff that Kabir was talking about before. Um, IDFA made that very simple. So the other alternative direction that I think we're exploring as an industry is what what replacement is there to still offer user user level level data user level capabilities um, that would f act as a replacement for the idfa and you know generically i think what people used beforehand was the ip address as the way to do confirmation of um, a conversion event and you know there's some question now and discussion about whether you know, that can be used reliably, what are the accuracy rates and that type of thing, but most certainly it will not be the same level of accuracy that you could offer with the IDFA, which was deterministic and you know, very reliable. And so I think right now from a measurement perspective, we're really at a, at a crossroads and um, you know, this direction of do we go aggregate only forever or figure out a way to offer user level optimization. Uh, just from our perspective, you know, I think based on how Kabir described the industry, I mean, there is so much reliance and so much momentum and dependence on user level data for things like, you know, internal optimization, audience building, just like everybody's internal data systems and business operations are dependent on uh, user level data to say, no thanks, we're going to go the direction of aggregate, we feel is just such an apocalyptic event that it's almost an impossibility. So, you know, from our perspective, we believe that there are ways to come up with mechanisms to still confirm user level uh, conversions and down funnel and all the same ROI and other capabilities that you can do, uh, but entirely relying on IP or other really more advanced techniques to do those confirmations. So our investments and all that are now primarily, uh, you know, in the direction of how can we still deliver on highly accurate user level confirmations. Although, you know, we are open to discussing ways that we can incorporate SK ad network data into that set to do comparisons or, you know, high level reporting or that type of thing, but we still believe it's necessary to offer user level. Yeah. So that, and, I think that's the uh, where we're all at now. Yeah, and I think uh, just to add some context, right? So, uh, as I mentioned, there have been like uh, like twenty to thirty percent lag rates, limit ad tracking rates for almost like three to four years. So, um, measurement companies have been tracking people who don't pass IDFA for almost four years anyway, right? But what they use is a a, a probabilistic way of matching. Uh, some measurement companies might say their probabilistic way is better than others, but uh, but eventually it's basic. It's a probabilistic way of matching. Uh, on the other hand, Google actually, while GAID is uh, their equivalent of IDFA, but Google also provides another way of tracking, which is the Google Refra, and a lot of people are are actually saying out there in the industry that Apple might should release or might release. Uh, an equivalent of the Google referral. Because if we see this whole thing in context, right, the the idea for Apple is to not um, not actually inhibit measurement of advertising. Their idea is to inhibit personalized advertising 
for people who don't consent for it right so the uh, the the fact that they have created a framework for people to be able to measure ads which is called the sk ad network it means that they want measurement to be there right and perhaps they don't want idfa to be used for measurement but in the future there is a good chance that they might release something like the google referrer uh, for for ios as well and i think uh, it is um, this 30% that the 30% of the users that have have not been tracked via idfa in the past 3 4 years might go to say 70 80% in the in the next few years right and uh, or say for the in the next one year and that is actually the problem because if your most of your measurement is dependent on probabilistic then deterministic uh, methodology then it becomes a bit of a problem right so yeah, yeah. that was the but i think there is um i think what will be really you know well, first to uh, talk to your point you know i all we also believe you know apple specific goal in this and you can see it a lot in the wording that they have in their policy is really around blocking the creation of a profile that can be shared across applications and you know the way that we think about some of these more probabilistic techniques is you know this is really your data as an advertiser where you know it's your link that the user is interacting with and it's your app that they interact with and you're going to get that log data anyway and you might give that to a third party to help you you know uh, compare it and build that attribution um you know more accurately but ultimately it's processing and you know leveraging your data to inform your own business analytics and that's definitely like there's no way that that would ever be viewed as a violation of a user privacy or you know against apple's wishes um but the other side of that too i think you know i'd say that we as an industry actually became lazy because we had such a you know easy method of doing this type of um comparison mm -hmm. what we'll see actually in the next like couple of years uh, you know maybe there is some sort of saving grace and reversal on apple's perspective with like a referrer type mechanism um although i you know i wouldn't hold my breath for it um it might be a little bit of ways out but the you know i think we'll see that the industry is really going to invest a lot in r&d and come up with really advanced techniques to to still offer highly accurate mechanisms for doing measurement and i hope uh targeting and other types of you know things to continue to support the momentum that we built as an industry to you know hopefully enable continuity otherwise i think you know if it was sk ad network fully aggregate only no device level i mean there could, it's almost like a covid type scenario on the advertising industry of a you know people won't know what the heck is going on they won't know where their dollars are are going if people will pull back dramatically spend is going to drop you know it's going to be total chaos and Only then maybe facebook and google it will remain <laughs> maybe they go to facebook and google quickly but it'll be like the you know is it a v shape is it a, a swoosh recovery mm. <laughs> like yeah, it'll yeah. be you know covid type <laughs> situation so um but yeah interesting to see i think the main thing we're waiting for now is I think Google and Facebook are uh considering what direction that they want to go and you know maybe it might be Google doubling down on their aggregate only mechanisms you know outside of SK ad network maybe Facebook might support device level through some sort of IP based thing um these are the thing I know they are discussing and and trialing everything right now and you know hopefully we have some direction on what mechanisms that they'll support within the next few weeks yeah also actually just to add some more uh, uh, some more light on the sk ad network right so i think from the adver advertisers perspective a few things change on sk ad network is as i think alex mentioned that is there's no log level data uh, which is a huge problem uh, especially for the kind of advertisers we work with they need log level data for the kind of analysis they need so since there's no log level data there is there are no cohort reports uh, there are uh, there is no post back that you can send to an ad network that means uh, ad networks or any other platform can't actually uh, do any kind of real time uh, real time optimization towards their goals 
Uh, so you would have to like pull a report from SCAD network and send it to them saying that this is how you perform. Uh, the reports will basically be aggregate and the amount of events that you are able to track is I, I think one or two. Uh, you're not able to, uh, or you're, I, I don't think people are able to uh, track more than a couple of events. I think it will be install and just another one event that they would be able to track. Um, so these are, these are big problems because the kind of advertisers we work with they want LTV analysis. They want to know how the campaigns did in a four day ROAS window. And so these things actually become a huge problem for them. But at this point of time, SCAD network uh, is, it seems like something that everyone would have to adopt. Uh, what I, I see this, I, what, how I see this playing out is <clears throat> most advertisers looking at SCAD network. So perhaps, uh, uh, getting it, uh, getting uh, getting SCAD network on their iTunes Connect as well, and at the same time also using uh, a measurement platform and kind of trying to match that data on how the uh, probabilistic uh, probabilistic plus a little bit of deterministic matching is doing, while how is uh, uh, how is SCAD network doing against that? Uh, the I think the and the biggest problem with I feel with uh, with uh, SCAD network is that it it gives only click based attribution, uh, which is like 2012. And I think uh, we have moved a lot ahead from that. Uh, and I think a lot of work has been done by measurement companies such as branch to kind of like take, uh, take uh, advertisers to another level of attribution. And I think when when Alex mentioned conspiracy theorists, right? So I think when conspiracy, the conspiracy theorists like to say that ASA will uh, gain out of this, which is Apple search ads will gain out of this because uh, usually search ads are the ones which do do the best when there is only click based uh, attribution. So yeah, but it's a conspiracy theory. It's not, I don't think it is. Uh, it is their uh, real motive out there. Yeah. Whether it is or not, I do think it's true. I mean, I, I'm yeah. not sure that that was the, the what, what Apple thought, the thought behind the changes, but whether yeah. it was a thought or not, I think you are right, and it will profit gain from this. Yeah. The, uh, you know, we we the reasons that we're a bit skeptical on SKAD network. I think you highlighted a bunch of them, um, Kabir, on like you know advertiser visibility basically goes you know near zero um, yeah. compared to where we're at today. Um, but actually, the adoption of SK ad network by the industry is almost like what's required makes it a, a non-starter. Uh, and the, the biggest issues we see is that, so a, as a, like if somebody wants to become an SK ad network, they have to register with Apple and then get an ID back from Apple. Then if a publisher wants to show an ad from that network, the publisher has to go and register that ID in their code and then re-release their app. And so that means that the publisher actually has to uh, list out in code what networks they're going to support when they publish their app. And if they don't, then they can't show ads from that network. So the only real way that that would happen is if like, you know, basically Facebook audience network or like ad mob become the only SK ad network of record and every other network just dies off. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just such an impossible like adoption barrier to actually see people use it. So we just see it feel like it's dead on arrival. I don't want to write it off. You know, there are going to be changes. Maybe we're going to get a couple people that try to adopt it. And, you know, we would love to support it. I'm very, very happy to re receive the data and process it and show the aggregate results. And we'll do that immediately as soon yep. as somebody indicates it. But there are very significant challenges to adopting it for the industry. Yeah, I think on that point, I feel that the only um, like advantage of using SCAD network uh, is that it kind of kills rebrokering because it is almost impossible to rebroker inventory, uh, which has been happening in the app space where ad networks buy from other ad networks, which goes down like five to five lines and then goes to a publisher. So in this case, the way you described it, Alex, I think this might kill that. But again, there are too many disadvantages against this small one advantage, I think. Yeah. 
So, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about SKR network and, and the more general things. I, I want to, this is definitely a webinar that was specifically for the Asia Pacific region. So Kabir, what are your thoughts on uh, the impact specifically on the market, uh, especially knowing that, uh, you know, the different operating systems in the market and, and the, there's not as many people on iOS in certain parts of APAC as in others. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think uh, the exposure of iOS devices uh, or, or exposure of this uh, this announcement to APAC is going to be much lower than other markets, for example, the US or the or Europe. But uh, there will be impact, right, for sure, because there are markets like Australia or uh, Japan and Korea, to an extent, Singapore and Thailand, they have their quite heavy iOS markets and they will definitely have an impact on, uh, they, 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 there would be a certain amount of impact. But at the same time, um, I think the uh, the impact would definitely be lower than other markets. The other thing that I think we need to uh, look at in APAC is uh, is the Google part, right? Because we are we are uh, we are dependent. We are obviously Google or Android is uh, the main major operating system in most markets. And I think uh, in general, how Google has behaved in these kind of uh, scenarios. In the past, by historical context, we can assume that Google might follow suit mm, in a yeah. couple of years. Uh, how they did with the intelligence? Sorry, maybe less than a couple. Looking yeah, at some yeah. of the changes that they've yeah. just done. Exactly, because uh, how they did with like intelligent tracking prevention, or even making the GID resettable, or even limit ad tracking, uh, it has followed suit. So I would be surprised yeah. if Google does not follow. And then it might take, say, a year or two for them to do. But when that comes in, uh, that actually will impact APAC in a big, big way. So I would, I would still say that uh, in the short term, advertisers in APAC should uh, obviously try to find short term solutions for this problem, which, not, which might not be very big, which might be only 10, 20% of their overall usage. The other thing we need to also note is iOS users are very high revenue users. And uh, though they might, might be a small percentage of the market, they provide a huge amount of huge percentage of revenue for apps in this space. So uh, if that measurement gets affected or if that targeting gets affected, uh, the 5% iOS users might be uh, perhaps 15 to 20% of revenue, right, for these apps. So yeah. and we should need to take into account, yeah. And we should keep in mind too that Google is, as we talked about before, highly incentivized to eliminate the Google advertising ID because in a world where you know no no other network actually has <laughs> the ability to do device level targeting and Google can still offer targeting they're going to siphon all the spend away so there is mm -hmm. substantial revenue opportunity for them in removing the Google advertising mm -hmm. ID they're more incentivized than Apple was to be honest but they probably couldn't have pulled it off first because regulators would have been all over them very quickly. So, you know, we have two minutes left. I want to end with this question around, we probably have a lot of people on the call that are wondering what should they do next? Um, what should be their next step? Where should they look? Um, you know, we will have a different webinar that will talk about how branches is, 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 is the branch of solution and stuff. So I want to end with that. I, I maybe think, I can. Uh, sorry, oh. Alec, do you want to get, yeah. Uh, well, I'll start mostly just on the, you know, measurement side and the advertiser side, um, but I'm sure we have folks represented everywhere and then, you know, definitely let, let, love to hear from you, Kabir, but, um, you know, the, there's just to be, you know, open and transparent, there's still quite a bit of uncertainty on the, the self-attributing network side. Um, and so we hope to have a lot more information on specifically what would change. We're pretty confident that we on them as like a measurement provider can actually handle most of the changes that come down the pipe. So the most immediate things we think people should be thinking about are actually their own, how they process and manage their own internal data. So that might be ingesting log level information to your own business intelligence system. Maybe you have some advanced, you know, data and analytics that are happening or audience generation or that type of stuff. All of that will have to change if it was previously based off of the IDFA and the click and the app session. 
And so um, starting to think about what are replacements and making sure that you're queuing up the work required internally to uh, actually you know, up, update those systems and make sure that they're ready for when this does happen. Otherwise, a lot of things will probably break. And those are probably the biggest types of projects that we need to start investing in now. And then I think outside of that are, of course, probably app updates and other things that are gonna be related to API changes, um, definitely things you, you, that you guys need to be making sure is on the roadmap and scheduled on the engineering team. Yeah, yeah, sounds good. I think uh, from, again, on the advertiser point of view, um, because this would affect a lot of different players and I know a lot of different uh, types of uh, players on the, in the ecosystem or on this call, but I'll just like, uh, say it from the advertiser's point of view, as I mentioned earlier, the first thing that they need to do is they should be speaking to their product team to understand how the system prompt message plays out, perhaps uh, uh, getting the iTunes connect to connect to SCAD network. I think even before that, speak to your mobile measurement partner and understand what they are doing about it because they might actually be integrating with SCAD network directly so they don't uh, so uh, 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 their product team does not need to connect into iTunes Connect directly. It might show up on the MMP platform itself. Uh, at the same time, I would highly advise uh, advertisers to do an IDFA audit. What that means is just understanding, uh, obviously one is the measurement side, but just understanding uh, from their perspective on how uh, IDFA affects, uh, uh, how, uh, how exposed they are to the IDFA and how it affects their different start uh, straighters of marketing. Uh, and, uh, and if you, um, and I think that is very important just to understand the exposure that you might have of, uh, of, uh, of uh, IDFA to an extent at this point of time. Uh, so that's very important to understand. But I think overall, it is in the next few months, advertisers should be working towards slowly and gradually uh, a, a place where uh, IDFA might not exist. And as I said earlier, it is, it is more about uh, 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 planning for the worst and hoping for the best. Yeah, that's great. Well, I think uh, overall, I think this is a, a big win for users. So we should never, despite all of the pain and suffering that you know, many of us will have to go through in updating the systems to prepare for that worst. We should note that it is still a good win for users and it's, we're all doing it with the you know, best intentions in mind. But I'm, I'm confident if we all work together, we'll be able to get through this. Thank you so much, uh, Alex and Kabir. On our side, we'll probably ha we'll have a webinar in a, another couple of weeks that goes more into depth to how uh, Branch is handling this uh, and what you need to do if you actually are a Branch user. Uh, but in the meantime, really appreciate your time. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you to everyone uh, who joined from all around the world. Thanks, guys. Thank you.